Eating a healthy diet is a lot like building a house. Now, imagine that instead of eating a healthy diet, we're trying to play Skyrim wrong. Now, imagine that when we're building a house, we can only use each tool for one time. Now, imagine two fish kissing. Now open your eyes. Two out of the three things you imagined are what led to hours of pain, turmoil, and some of the wildest Skyrim that's ever been played. That's how the video would have started if my computer didn't break. Unfortunately, Todd Howard wanted to censor me from releasing it to the public, so he fried my motherboard and my graphics card and wiped my hard drive. But I didn't let that stop me. At the end of my last video, I said this. I haven't failed until I've given up. And I won't give up. And I meant it. This is how I beat my most frustrating challenge twice. Let me elaborate on what the challenge is. Our goal is to kill Alduin and finish the main quest. We'll be playing on legendary difficulty with permadeath. We also can't use followers or glitches because we hate when things are easy. Finally, the bread and butter of this challenge is the final rule. Use it and lose it. With this rule, we can only use each weapon, spell, shout, and ability once. There are a few additional rules and exceptions to the rules, but I'll go over each of them as they come up. If you'd like to do your homework early, you can check out this video of some of my previous attempts at this challenge. Before we get started on our journey, we need to figure out which race we're going to play as. Essentially, the two smartest options would be Breton with a very useful passive but a pretty mid ability, or Orc with a useless passive but a great ability. We decide to go with an Orc named Skuma Enjoyer. I know what you're thinking. Edge, what's a dime piece like you doing playing as an Orc when you just said that you can only use your ability once? First of all, you're making me blush. Second of all, yes. Breton's magic assist is really nice, but there's one oblivion level threat in this challenge that's near impossible to beat without the orcish racial ability. I won't spoil it right now, but you'll see why we need it. So, now that we've got that settled, we set off on what would become my most stressful challenge yet. Before we set off, I need to apologize for the quality for the first bit of gameplay. Since I had to reinstall everything, my recording settings were all messed up and I didn't realize it until after I started. Please don't get mad at me. It gets fixed after the first real dungeon. Now that that's done with, we can start our journey. Once this nice dragon saves our life, we do some running and jumping and make our way into Helgen Keep. Once inside, we get out of our binds and pick up our first weapon, a humble war axe, and then hide in the shadows. This makes it so that our friend Rayloff will solo the two Imperial goons that come to crash our party letting us keep our one and only weapon. While they do this, we carefully need to peek out every once in a while to get noticed. We do this to level up our sneak, as it'll help us avoid a lot of combat. Near the end of this fight, the Imperials no longer notice us and Rayloff finishes them off, letting us pick up their armor as well as an Imperial sword and an iron dagger. In a nearby room, we also get to pick up an iron sword, meaning that we now have five total weapons, including our flame spell. We opt to put on heavy armor, because without it, we would die instantly. At least with heavy armor, only be dying quickly. Moving on from the starting area, we head down to a room with two other Imperials, where we let Rayloff take them out while we loot the room for food and ingredients. Moving on from here, we let Rayloff take out the Imperials. This time, he's got help from his Stormcloak friends. This room is important for us, as it gives us the spell Sparks, an Iron Mace, a Steel Dagger, and an Iron Shield. Because shields fall under the apparel tab, we don't need to drop them after each use. In the next room, we let the Stormcloaks fight the Imperials, and we loot a longbow and a bunch of arrows. One of the exceptions to the use it and lose it rule is that we can pick our arrows back up after using them. Since there's no way to differentiate between an iron arrow we shot at someone and an iron arrow they already had in their inventory, it's just simpler if we allow ourselves to pick our arrows back up. In the penultimate room of the dungeon, again, we let Rayloff take care of the enemies, this time frostbite spiders, and move on. In the final room of the first dungeon, we're given a dilemma. Take a bow from Rayloff and attack the bear, or sneak past without waking it. Because we don't like playing by the rules, we take the bow and sprint past the bear, finally reaching the beautiful countryside of Skyrim. Now that we're free, let me outline the quests we'll need to overcome. Here are all of the quests in the main questline. 
Let's weed out the smaller quests where we just need to go somewhere or talk to someone. Now that we've got a more compact list of quests, I'll highlight the ones that have a good chance of ending the run. Oh. If we're going to beat this challenge, we're going to need to be very particular about every single thing we do. Since we're out of Tutorial Island, things are going to immediately get much more difficult for us. We no longer have Rayloft to help us out, and enemies will be pretty much impossible for us to kill for a while. This is where we introduce the only way that this challenge is possible. Alchemy. Throughout this challenge, we'll need to be able to augment our stats, abilities, and damage so that we have the tools available to not instantly die. Live Edge Omega, Omega announcement. announcement. I understand that alchemy is a broken skill that can cause the game to become one punch man simulator. So, to keep the integrity of the challenge, I've implemented an alchemy level cap of 50 to keep it interesting. This lets us use alchemy to come up with interesting solutions to problems without having alchemy be the solution to our problems. Now, let's get back to our regularly scheduled programming. So, all throughout this challenge, we will be using a technique that I call loot goblining, where we pick up every single ingredient we find so we can make as many potions as we need. I won't include every time I go into loot goblin mode to save time, but just understand that about 4 hours of this challenge were spent picking flowers. We make our way to the standing stones nearby and choose a thief stone to boost our XP gain for thief attributes, which includes alchemy and our second most important skill, sneak. Because our weapon pool is limited, we'll need to avoid combat as much as possible, meaning we'll need to be leveling our sneak as much as possible. Leaving from the standing stones, we run into our first obstacle on our own, a pack of wolves. This isn't very much of a problem for us, as we just hop across the river to stay out of their aggravation range and we don't have to waste a few weapons on some wolves. Once in Riverwood, we talk with Gerder, letting her know all the chiz that went down in Helgen, and we make our way to Whiterun to further spread the good word. On our way there, we carefully parkour between a couple of wolves to stay out of sight, and we get to Whiterun soon after. Once inside, we become loot goblins once again and pick every single flower in Whiterun. After this, we head to Dragon's Reach and have a quick and productive conversation with the Jarl, where his side piece Farangar lets us know that we need to head to Bleak Falls Barrow. We then immediately head to Riften, where we start a quest for the Church of Mara. After uniting and reuniting some lovers, we return to Riften, where we're given an additional 15% magic resist. Hooray! We're now ready for the first dungeon. Before we even reach the dungeon, there are a group of bandits that are guarding our path. Thankfully, Todd Howard planned for this exact scenario and there's some wicked parkour that we can do to sneak past them. Now that we're in the clear, we reach Bleak Falls Barrow, where we need to sneak past the bandits. This one is a little trickier than what we just did, as there are much more bandits and not really a way to go around them. Thankfully, the entrance to the dungeon is extruding from the side of a mountain, meaning that we can scoot past most of them by climbing up the mountain and getting up on the side of the entrance. We're not in the clear just yet though, as there's a patrolling bandit right next to the door. We decide to take off all our armor as it'll help us move more quietly. The bandit patrols between the far end of the entrance and in front of the entrance, so we go into third person view to see where she's at in her patrol without her being able to see us. Real quick, I just gotta say that statistically only about 4% of you are subscribed, so if you guys could go hit that fun little cute little subscribe button down below, it would make me happy because the number is going up. Thanks. After waiting for her to turn around, we quickly make the final stretch to the door. Awesome, we're finally inside, where we loot a steel war axe. Now, the first thing that we need to do is... Uh, sneak past some bandits. This seems like it's going to be a very common theme throughout this challenge. These bandits, thankfully, are as blind as a bat, and we're able to make it most of the way past them without them detecting us. Apparently, we're not worth the effort though, because they decided to stop following us after a brief chase. We then watch the next installment of the Saw franchise as we see a man fail a puzzle and immediately die. Once he kicks the bucket, we solve the puzzle he couldn't. After walking through the previously blocked room, we loot a chest and get an iron battle axe. Then, we reach the first of the highly dangerous sections of the dungeon. After descending some stairs, we'll need to run past some skeevers, break a spider wall, enter the massive frostbite spider den, cut Arvel down, and run out. The skeevers are annoying and dangerous for sure, but the large frostbite spider is what makes this part difficult. 
There's a random chance that the frostbite spider will target the skeevers instead of us. If it does target us, then there's a small chance that it'll miss its attack. However, if the spider targets us and hits its attack, we'll almost certainly die in one hit. Thankfully, after dodging the skeevers and making our way into the spider den, we're able to cut Arvel down just before the spider attacks, meaning that we get over the first hurdle in the dungeon. Once we cut Arvel down, we're supposed to kill him and take the golden claw, but thankfully for us, he kills the skeevers and then immediately runs face first into a trap, meaning we get to save a weapon. We pick up the golden claw off his body and become a track star as we run deeper into the dungeon. As we run, we wake up dozens of Draugr, almost die to a couple of traps, and just barely make it into the next section before we close a gate, blocking the Draugr from following us. In this cave is a chest, where we get a scroll of fireball. There's a Draugr in the way of our path, so we use the game mechanics to our advantage, making the Draugr search for us and then taking a shortcut while it isn't looking. In the final room of this section of the dungeon is another Draugr, but thankfully our sneak is high enough that we make it past without it following us. In the new room, we sprint through some swinging blades, do some parkour, run through a door, and start sneaking. Because if the Draugr end up finding us, we would have to fight the boss as well as two more Draugr, which obviously isn't ideal. Thankfully, we get him off our tail and enter the boss room. We prepare for the fight, read the word wall, and start the battle. Now, I've realized that we've managed to avoid combat throughout the challenge so far, so let me do some clarification. If we use a weapon or destruction spell on enemy X, we're allowed to keep using it on enemy X for as long as we like. Typically, this means that we'd use it until we kill them, but there are some situations where we'd stop attacking before that happens. Once we're done attacking enemy X, we have to mark everything we used against them as being unusable for the rest of the challenge. So. With this knowledge, let's get back to the first boss fight. And this fight is incredibly easy. This is probably the easiest fight in the entire challenge. The Draugr Overlord doesn't have any ranged attack other than the unrelenting force shout. There's hardly any damage. So all we need to do is keep our distance while whittling him down with our flame spell, dipping across different platforms and causing the Draugr to take a long path before we would be within melee range. So. After 5 minutes of playing Ring Around the Rosy, we finish him off, marking off flames, picking up an Ancient Nord War Axe of Chills, and finally retrieving the Dragonstone. After this, we head back to Riverwood to give the nice man his golden claw back. Then, after taking all the food he owns, we realize that we're carrying too much stuff, so we decide to sell all of our extra weapons before realizing that we're actually buying weapons from him. <sighs> so we sell everything except for a new Iron Greatsword back to him, drop our Iron Battle Axe after realizing we're still overweight, and head back to Farangar to turn in the Dragonstone. The Jarl then entrusts us, a random stranger who he's known for a day, to kill a dragon. Before we head out, we decide to disenchant our Ancient Nord War Axe we just picked up and put the Frost Enchantment on our Longbow because it's the only way we'll be able to do meaningful damage against the dragon. Next, we finally visit the alchemy shop. We have our first cook, and oh do we cook, and cook, and cook some more. By the end of it, we've made and sold over a thousand gold worth of potions, where we immediately spend most of it on a hunting bow of frost, because once we fight this dragon, we'll be in need of a new bow. We then immediately steal this conveniently placed imperial bow, meaning that now we've got an extra extra just in case. This puts us over our weight limit though, so we opt to drop our Iron Greatsword. Now that we've got that settled, it's time to fight a dragon. Once we arrive at the watchtower, the dragon decides to make its appearance. Thankfully for us though, this dragon fight is one of the easiest in this challenge. All we have to do is stay in the watchtower and beat it down with our arrows while it attacks the guards down below. Four minutes and a very close call later, we take him out. Somehow, we must have been blessed by Todd Howard himself, because we find out that we are the first person in modern history to become Dragonborn. This means that we can suck the soul out of this dragon, adding the Shao Unrelenting Force to our repertoire. Since we killed the dragon, we need to head back to the Jarl and let him know what's up. On our way, we hear a bunch of old men yelling at clouds, and the Jarl fills us in about the Greybeards, a bunch of old men dedicated towards dragon shouts 
conveniently located on the highest mountain in Skyrim. The Jarl also gives us the Axe of Whiterun, and now's a good time to explain another exception to the Use It and Lose It rule, uniquely named weapons. Typically, we wouldn't be able to use duplicate weapons, meaning that once we use a glass sword, we can't use any more glass swords. However, if we find the weapon Chilrend, which is a uniquely named glass sword, these weapons are counted separately on our list, meaning that we could use each of them once. So right now, we just received the Axe of Whiterun, which is a uniquely named Steel Battle Axe, meaning that we can use it in addition to a regular Steel Battle Axe. So with that boring clarification out of the way, we head to Iverstead, where we start our trek to High Hrothgar. There are a few creepy crawlies on the mountain, but we managed to get out of harm's reach just before we would have died to some wolves. Once we're at the monastery, Head Honcho Arngear asks us to prove our dragonbornness by shouting at him, where we encounter another exception to the challenge. I said earlier that we can only use each shout once, but that's not entirely true. Because there are certain moments throughout the story where shouting is required, these moments don't count against our shout usage. So, as we demonstrate our power with unrelenting force, we're still allowed to use it later on. Impressed with our work, he wants to teach us a new shout, Whirlwind Sprint, allowing us to move in a straight line very quickly, great for getting out of a bad situation. Since we're the Dragonborn, it's our duty to do random tasks for these old dudes, the first of which is retrieving some old artifact. On our way there, we stop in Morthal so we can sell more of the potions we made earlier. We do this because it gives us enough gold to buy our new best friend, Skuma Enjoyer's horse. With our new best friend, we head back to Morthal, ride Skuma Enjoyer's horse up a nearby mountain, say hi to some locals, and swap out our Thief Stone with the Lord Stone, giving us an extra 50 armor points as well as 25% magic resistance. Hooray! We head back to Morthal to make a bunch of healing potions, accidentally steal from the alchemist, which surely won't come back to bite us, head outside, where we're kindly greeted by some friendly looking people that are trying to sell us something that we're not buying, and they get mad and try and kill us. Thankfully, the guards here take care of them for us, so we don't need to waste any weapons. While the guards deal with them, we head off to continue the main quest. Before we can enter the ruins, there are a bunch of bandits that really want to harsh our vibe. Thankfully, there's a Stormcloak camp nearby that helps us out. While they did that, I decided to watch the beauty of nature as these horses did their mating ritual. In a chest at the entrance of the ruins, we find an orcish warhammer. Cool! Before entering the Nordic ruins containing the urn of Jürgen Flergendurgen, we recognize that we have a daunting task ahead of us. There are a bunch of wizards, draugr, skeletons, and frostbite spiders throughout the dungeon, and we need to be able to avoid all of them. Additionally, there's an optional word wall that we could choose to get there's a lot of extra risk with getting it. Naturally, we'll be getting it. As we enter the dungeon, we immediately take off our armor to help us sneak, and we're confronted with our first obstacle, wizards. Thankfully for us, there's a scripted event that occurs a while after you enter the dungeon, and the wizards leave to fight the Draugr. We sneak up behind them and wait for the fight to finish, and the Draugr inevitably kill the wizards. On one of the wizards bodies, we find a scroll of blizzard, which is definitely going to come in handy in a bind. Now that the wizards are out of the way, we face our next challenge, the Draugr. The big problem with these bad boys is that one of them will be using the spell Frostbite on us, which deals damage, slows, and drains stamina. Obviously, not ideal when we're being chased by a bunch of enemies, but we're smarter than they are. When we enter the next area of the dungeon, we reach a large cliff overhanging a later section of the dungeon. Typically, you would need to take the long way around to avoid this, but given the current circumstances, we don't really have that option. Instead, we have to jump off the cliff and land on a very specific section of a pillar, and that keeps us from taking enough fall damage to kill us. Because these poor Draugr's brains have gone smooth after all the years of deterioration, they decide not to follow us down the cliff, and we now are on to the next challenge, skeletons. Typically, we wouldn't need to worry about them because we drop down right in front of the entrance to the next section, but we're greedy. We need to go back across the bridge, past a bunch of skeletons, and down the pit to get the Become Ethereal Shout. This seems like a lot of work for a shout that we can only use once, but this shout has insane value. It allows us to become invincible for a short amount of time, which is obviously very nice to have in a challenge where we can die in less than a second. 
So we start off on our heist mission, which turns out to be only a little difficult, as skeletons tend to be pretty oblivious to us when we're sneaking. Now that we've got the shout, we need to go all the way back across the bridge and use our whirlwind sprint shout to get through a puzzle and enter the final section of the dungeon. Here, we need to be careful where we step, as the ground is covered in flame traps. Additionally, there's not one, but two spider webs that we need to cut through that are being guarded by some frostbite spiders. Like the first dungeon, it's pretty random whether or not these will kill us, so we just hack away at the webs and pray that they don't one-shot us. Thankfully, only one of them hits us and it's with a poison attack, meaning that it damages us slow enough that we have enough time to heal. And with the final web down, we make it past the spiders and finally get the Horn of Bjorn Thunderstorm. Except, it's been stolen. Just our luck. In its place is a mysterious note telling us to meet up in Riverwood to get some answers. Before we leave the dungeon, we find a chest with an orcish war axe, but we have to drop our orcish war hammer to stay under carrying capacity. Once we make it out of the dungeon, we go back to Morthal and find the guards still dealing with the whole cultish drama. We decide to stay and watch the guards kill them so we can feel safe knowing they won't come for us later on. On one of their bodies, we find a staff of flames, adding it to our list. Once we're in Riverwood, we find out that the thief was actually the owner of the local inn, and she lets us know that she's been looking for us, and we've got a new job to do. Kill another dragon. Before we go do this for her, we loot her entire secret bunker, gaining a blade sword, a scroll of call to arms, and a whole lot of ingredients. Unfortunately, this puts us overweight, so we need to drop our iron sword, as well as the 37 cabbages we've been picking up over the course of the challenge. We then go on a long journey of collecting ingredients and making potions, which made us overweight again, so we had to drop the staff of flames that we just picked up. Sorry. Now that we're all potioned up, we're ready for our second dragon fight. After meeting up with Delphine, we see that helpful dragon from earlier that saved our life, now resurrecting a dead dragon. Once the dragon comes back to life, Alduin leaves and we begin the fight. This one, unlike the first one, is incredibly difficult. And by incredibly difficult, I mean incredibly easy. This dragon pretty much only targets Delphine, who, unlike us, is an incredibly tanky. This means that we can chip away at the dragon freely while it deals with her. That is, until we have to fight the Ghost of Christmas Past. The three Ghosts of Christmas Past, actually, because we now have to face the consequences of our actions. Remember earlier when we accidentally stole a measly little potion from the alchemist in Morthal? Well, apparently, she decided to hire a gang of thugs to kill us and call it Even Stevens. This couldn't have come at a worse time for us, as our entire game plan here was to let Delphine do all the heavy lifting. Instead, the thugs attack Delphine, causing her to go down, which means that we now are fighting the dragon and three thugs without the help of Delphine. On top of this, the dragon decides not to attack the thugs, and the thugs decide not to attack the dragon. Just great. So, because we don't have the firepower to take on these thugs, we have to do the only thing that we can do, and stand on top of this rock, just out of reach of the thugs, while we solo the dragon. Because Delphine is an essential NPC, she isn't permanently out of the fight, however, each time she stands back up, the thugs instantly down her again. So, at least now we don't need to worry about the thugs, but we're completely vulnerable to the dragon. Since there's nothing we can do about this, we just have to slowly chip away at the dragon with our bow while we use up a boatload of health potions. Finally, 10 minutes later, we land the last blow on the dragon, dropping our hunting bow and sucking its soul. Now that the dragon's dealt with, Delphine gets her sea legs and takes out the bandits, meaning that somehow we survived this flaming pile of poo that was left on our doorstep. For our efforts, we're rewarded with some new armor, a steel mace, and another flaming pile of poo. This poo, however, comes in the shape of the Thalmor Embassy, which we need to infiltrate. Delphine also gave us the ancient rock of Hamlin Thundershock, which we return to the Greybeards, where they reward us with the final word of the Unrelenting Force Shout. We then do another round of ingredient gathering and ingredient togethering, and after making a fortune off of selling them all, we spend it all on a necklace of resist magic and an iron shield of dwindling magic, increasing our total magic resistance to 65%. This is a huge power spike for us, and by power spike, 
I mean that it's another step in us not dying instantly to an enemy spell. This is probably as prepared as we could ever be. So we head off to Solitude, give Delphine's inside man all of our stuff, and head to the Thalmor Embassy. Once inside, we make use of an alcoholic by giving him some brandy and having him cause a distraction. We use this opportunity to dip from the party, where we can get our gear back and start the real mission, figuring out what they know about dragons. To do this, we need to sneak through the embassy and around a bunch of Thalmor, where we can read the Thalmor's journals. So, like always, the first step is to take off our armor. That made me feel a little weird, so then we put back on our party clothes. Now that we're more sneaky, we pop a fortified sneak potion and wait for the guards to go on their patrols. This is very finicky though, as it's very possible that one of the guards could spot us out of their peripheral vision. Great. The whole sneak part of the infiltration plan is out of the window now. We're now facing about five high level enemies that all wield very powerful spells. Thankfully, my cat paid me a visit and gifted me a newfound confidence in my ability to overcome this. So, after putting on all of our armor, drinking a potion of resistance for each element as well as magic as a whole, we make a run for it. For some reason, we call it divine intervention or call it a cat buff, none of the Thalmor decide to follow us through the door. After popping an invisibility potion, we become undetected, somehow getting past that hurdle. Unfortunately, if that was a hurdle, we now face a mountain. After looting a chest, we descend into the dungeon of the embassy where we need to retrieve a book that tells us about a man named Esbern who might know more about the dragons. This is the easy part of the mountain, and now it's time to climb the mountain part of the mountain. After learning about Esbern, a plethora of Thalmor step into the dungeon. We can't just avoid these guys the way we've been avoiding most of the other enemies, as the only way out is a trapdoor that needs a key, and the key is on one of the Thalmor. That means that we need to give everything we have into killing one of these Thalmor, and then we just need to hope that the one we killed has the key. All the while, each of the other guards will be trying their hardest to kill us. So we start off combat by using the scroll of blizzard we picked up back when we looted that lizard wizard. It was just a regular wizard, but I like rhyming. While we're casting this though, we almost die, showing just how quick this run could end. We then use a paralysis potion on our steel mace letting us isolate the Thalmor we decide to attack and finally use our orcish racial ability. Remember earlier when I said it was the only reason this challenge is possible? Well, this is why. It lets us go ham on this one Thalmor while we're able to tank multiple hits from all the other guards. It's still not easy by any means, but we've stocked up on enough health potions to allow us to survive long enough to kill the guard, which very luckily had the trapdoor key. If we didn't have the orcish racial ability, we would have spent twice as long in combat and taken twice the damage we did. It would have been certain death. So, now that we have the key, drop the still mace and go through the trapdoor into a cave, where the Thalmor decide to follow us. On top of this, there's a frost troll in this cave we need to avoid. So, we run to the end of the cave and out into the wilderness of Skyrim, where the Thalmor decide to follow us. They actually keep following us until we make our way all the way back to the farm outside of Solitude. From there, we fast travel to Riverwood. We mark off our ability, meaning that we've conquered one of the most difficult parts of the challenge. Now that the Thalmor section is over with, we talk with Delphine and find out that we need to rescue Esbern from the Thalmor. Cool. We head to Riften and speak with a man named Brynjolf, who makes us ruin a man's life and tells us to meet him in the Ratway underneath the city. To get there, we need to navigate through some tunnels and run past a bunch of goons. Before we head into his lair, we pull this lever, which you'll see why soon. Now that we're here, we learn that Esbern is deeper in the Ratway, and the only way to get through him is through a bunch of Thalmor guards. However, we only need an invisibility potion to drop down some platforms and get past the guards. After we finally reach Esbern, he agrees to follow us out. The main challenge though, is getting out as we need to navigate numerous rooms and hallways, each filled with angry Thalmor. Thankfully, we have a deus ex machina, Esbern. Since we just rescued him, he acts temporarily as a follower, and as such, cannot be killed. This means that as long as we can get past them, there's a chance that they'll switch to targeting Esbern. It's not much to go off of, but it ends up working. After re-entering the first section of the Ratway, 
were swarmed by even more Thalmor, but thanks to the bridge being lowered from earlier, we were able to make a quick escape, making the record between us and the Thalmor 2 to 0. Not counting any of the times we died to Thalmor in the previous attempts. Once we finish escorting Esbern back to Delphine, we learn that Delphine must have some sick mind because she wants us to go into another highly guarded location, this time to learn about how to defeat Alduin. The place we need to go, Skyhaven Temple, is in the far west, so we decide to head to Markarth. Thanks to Skuma and Jor's horse, we're able to ride straight up a mountain, avoiding a very large number of Forsworn and a dragon. After entering a cave, Delphine and Esbern decide to follow us in, taking out the locals that reside inside. Thanks to them, we're able to pick up a Forsworn axe and an orcish dagger. We continue through the cave, solving a few puzzles and doing a silly little blood sacrifice, and we finally make it in Skyhaven Temple. In here is a large wall depicting the history of Alduin. Esbern goes on a much too long-winded speech about the whole World Eater drama and finds out that the ancient Nord heroes used a shout to banish Alduin. Awesome! We now have a lead on how to stop him, so we need to go talk with the old dudes because they seem to know a lot about shouts. Before we head out, we pick up some cool new armor as well as a sword made specifically for dragon killing, Dragon Bane. We meet up with the old dudes who basically tell us to kick rocks. It goes against their code to teach us about a shout that's used against dragons. Fortunately, a booming voice overrules their decision and instead they say that we need to meet with their leader Parthenax. To get there, we have to learn a new shout, Clear Skies, to clear the skies blocking your path. With it, we're able to scale to the tippy top of the mountain where we find out that Parthenax is actually a dragon. To prove ourselves, we get into a shouting match with him which apparently impresses him enough to help us. He tells us that we need to find the Elder Scrolls V, Skyrim, in order to learn the shout the ancient heroes used. In order to find the shout, we need to head to the library of the College of Winterhold. Once there, we just need to cast a spell that proves that we're capable of entering. Wow. Because we don't have enough magicka, we're prevented from entering the college. Since we can't progress the main quest, that means the run is over. Just kidding. Since we've got some insider knowledge, we don't need to figure out where to go. We can just go there. There being a secluded outpost way up north. When we get there, we find a kooky old man that gives us some weird toys and tells us that the Elder Scroll is located in an ancient Dwemer ruins known as Blackreach. Before we head there, it's been a while since we've properly prepared, so we head back to Whiterun to make a bunch of potions, buy a bunch of cure poison potions, and buy a hunting bow of Arking. But Edge, you've already used a hunting bow. Shh. I know, little one. The reason that we get this is because of its shock enchantment which we'll be able to disenchant and put on any bow we want to use in the future. So after getting the bow, we drop the iron war axe that we got at the very start of the game to make sure that we stay light and agile. Now that we're ready, we head to Winterhold and begin riding Skuma and Jory's horse for about 10 seconds before we encounter a dragon. We decided this is above our pay grade, so we turn ourselves around and wait in an inn for a day. The following morning, we head off to Blackreach, running past some snowy saber cats and that dragon from before on the way there. Once inside, we don't dilly-dally at all. We're here for the Elder Scroll and that's it. So we run past everyone here, past the Dwarven Spider Workers, past the Weird Dude, past the Dwarven Spheres, past the Falmer, past the Dwarven Centurions, past the two people that feel a little out of place, past the Chorises, and past the giant glowing orb. In the process, we pick up a Falmer War Axe, drink 11 minor healing potions, 12 homemade healing potions, and eat in this order, 10 carrots, 1 brook bass, 1 eider cheese wedge, 2 goat cheese wedges, 2 gourds, and 9 green apples, totaling 812 health healed. Now that that's finally done with, we play with this fidget toy for a few minutes and a large crystal descends from the ceiling which opens up, revealing the Elder Scroll. After picking it up, we're now only a couple steps away from the end game. <laughs> We need to fight Alduin. In order to prepare, we buy all of the arrows that money can buy, collect a bunch of ingredients to make healing potions, and encounter a dragon, which we lead back to Whiterun so the guards can take care of it. Now that we're prepared, we head back to the Throat of the World and read the Elder Scroll. In a vision of the past, 
we learn the shout that the ancient heroes used to defeat Alduin. When we return to the present, Alduin is there, waiting for us, and the fight begins. There are a lot of problems with this fight. First and foremost, we can only damage Alduin when he's on the ground, meaning that we need to constantly be using the new Dragon Rin shout we just learned. Additionally, Alduin has a unique shout that no other dragon has that calls meteors down from the sky, dealing a good chunk of damage each time we get hit. On top of all of this, he has a 50% resistance to all damage sources, so we're going to be in this fight for the long haul. In order to play this smartly, we have a few ways to swing the fight in our favor. Because we were able to chant our bow with a shock enchantment, every time we hit Alduin, we drain his magicka. This might not seem very helpful, but dragons actually use magicka for their shouts. When coupled with a poison that doesn't allow him to regenerate magicka, it's only a matter of time before he's unable to use any more shouts. That is, until we run out of these poisons. About a fourth of the way through the fight, when we have only two poisons left, we're running low on our premium arrows, and our bow is quickly losing charges on its enchantment, it seems like we probably won't be finishing this challenge. That is, until a new challenger enters the ring. That's right, Skuma and Joyer's horse, in some crazy turn of events, comes out of nowhere to personally save this run. Because of this, Alduin switches targeting and instead begins to attack our hero. While he does this, we're free to attack without the fear of being targeted by Alduin. We're not completely in the clear, however, as we still need to worry about the meteor storms. Just as we're about to finish him off, we get incredibly unlucky and get hit by three meteors in quick succession, almost killing us. But we're just lucky enough that we barely survive, letting us land the final blow on Alduin and we drop our last weapon, an Imperial Bow. Finally, after all of this time, I'm finally able to put this challenge behind me. Wait, what? Okay, so apparently we didn't actually kill him. For magic reasons, I guess. Instead, he flew away to who knows where. Parthenax, in his great wisdom, thinks that we should trap a dragon and force it to tell us where Alduin went. So that's exactly what we'll do. Apparently, Whiterun just so happens to have a dragon trapping mechanism, which seems very oddly convenient. All we have to do is get permission from the Jarl and... But I can't do it. We'll just have to keep fighting the dragons as best we can. What... Okay, so small detour. Before we continue, we need to stop the civil war in Skyrim. Only for a little bit though, just long enough for us to trap the dragon. So we go on a very long-winded mission to get the Imperial and Stormcloak leaders together to negotiate a temporary peace treaty. After 15 minutes of the most boring party ever, these lame people settle their beef and Esbern, who decided to show up uninvited, out of nowhere teaches us a shout that can call a dragon, which again seems very oddly convenient. Before we go trap a dragon, we need to make some more health potions, and as we're gathering ingredients, we get attacked by a dragon. Slow your roll, bucko. We don't need you just quite yet. So we hide out in the tower from our very first dragon fight as we let the guards take it out. The guards and this guy, who I'm not really sure what his deal is, but he's here I guess. And this mud crab? After a riveting fight, the mud crab falls to the weird vomiting man. Oh, and the dragon dies too. Now that that's over, we go to finish gathering ingredients when we're attacked by another dragon. At this point, it's just a waste of time to wait for other people to kill it, so we just steal a dwarven dagger lying around and leave because we don't want the drama. Back in Whiterun, we make one final cook, enchant our dwarven bow, and let the Jarl know that we're ready. We then head out to the trap and use our call dragon shout luring the sick looking dragon and inadvertently killing this poor guard. His sacrifice isn't in vain though, after a dragon rend, we spring the trap. Alduin really needs to rethink who his friends are, because this dragon is jumping at the opportunity to spill the beans on where he went. Apparently, he went to Sovngarde, the Nordic afterlife. Since we're not Nords, that means that we can't get to Sovngarde, and the run is over. So apparently, there's an oddly convenient portal to Sovngarde, but it's impossible for us to get there, 
meaning that the run is over. So apparently this dragon is willing to fly us near enough to the portal that we can get there on our own. Hooray! So we hop on his back and fly away to near certain doom. <laughs> We've got a gauntlet ahead of us. We need to navigate all the way around these ruins, dodging a multitude of high-level Draugr, many of which wield hard-to-dodge bows and spells. Oh, and there's a dragon. Oh, and there's another dragon. So we sneak up as far as we can and then make our mad dash. Right off the gate, we get incredibly unlucky, as the first dragon that attacks us is a frost dragon, meaning that our stamina gets drained instantly. Thankfully, We've come prepared, and have enough stamina potions to kill a horse if we threw all of them really hard at it. After refilling our stamina, we make one final dash to the entrance of the dungeon. Yeah, all of that was just to get into the dungeon. We've got a much larger problem on our hands now, because we need to solve a puzzle while dodging all of the Draugr in the room as well as all the Draugr that decide to follow us into the dungeon. We were barely able to solve the puzzle without dying, but we managed to make it out of the first room, letting us move forward past some more Draugr and some frostbite spiders and into a new puzzle room. Thankfully, this room only has a couple of Draugr in it. We quickly solved the puzzle and entered the next section of the dungeon. Here, we need to navigate around a bunch more Draugr, which almost kill us, but we get by. We then run up some stairs and run into a huge problem. We need to go into a room and pull a lever that will open a gate. But when we go into that room, we immediately get blocked off by some Draugr. Because we can't just hack our way through this problem, we need to parkour and shield bash these Draugr until we make a path through. Once we do this, we make it to the last challenge of the dungeon. Ahead of us is a Draugr Overlord. But we can't just run past this guy. We need to loot his body to get the key to the door behind him. So, we prepare for the fight as much as we can drinking potions, putting on an enchanted necklace, and even putting our last skill point into dealing more damage with a sneak attack. We equip our blade sword, sneak up behind the Draugr, and start going ham. The Draugr Overlord is using an Ancient Nord Battle Axe, which brings both ups and downs to the fight. It's good for us in the sense that its attacks are slow and predictable, but the problem is that if we miss a single block with our shield, it could one-shot us. So we spend the next two minutes bobbing and weaving all of his attacks blocking at just the right time and kiting around the room to prevent us from getting blocked in. For some reason, I'm also trying to dodge all of his attacks in real life while sitting in my chair. After a really close call, we're able to finally finish him off, letting us pick up his ancient Nord battle axe and the key and walk through the door. The final room doesn't have any enemies, but instead has a word wall with a storm call shout on it. After absorbing the word, we get ready for the final run. The portal to Savangard is guarded by multiple Draugr, dragons, and a dragon priest, which is an incredibly powerful sorcerer that would kill us near instantly. The portal is only being kept open by the dragon priest's staff. Typically, we'd be prevented from running straight past him because the dragon priest would pick up his staff at the start of combat, closing the portal. However, we came with a plan. If we can get close enough to the portal without dying, we can use our Whirlwind Sprint Shout to zoom past the Dragon Priest and enter the portal before he even has a chance to grab his staff. So we do a short prayer to the Divines and make our final sprint. We're immediately under fire by the same dragon from before, sapping our stamina and slowing us, meaning that there's even a smaller chance that we'll be able to make it to the portal. We don't give up though, and keep moving, using Whirlwind Sprint at the very last second and barely, just barely making it into the portal, meaning that we're now in the end game. As we take our first steps into Sovngarde, we're met by a thick fog. A Stormcloak soldier stops to tell us something, but we're not here to chat. Immediately after, we see Aldwin rise from the fog and fly away, almost as if he's taunting us. After wandering through the fog, we come to a large bone bridge guarded by a hulking warrior named Soon. Only the worthy are allowed to cross, so we need to beat Soon in combat. This guy is the strongest person we've had to fight. He's got a ton of health and deals a ton of damage, which is bad news for us. We initially try using Unrelenting Force on him, but he does the same to us, and I imagine that they cancel each other out like in Harry Potter. 
So we come up with a new plan. I recognize that this person is a melee fighter whose only ranged attack is his own unrelenting force shout. Remind you of anyone else? That's right. Our penultimate enemy we need to defeat is just an upgraded version of the very first enemy we had to defeat way back at the start of the challenge. Because of this, we know that we can use the same tactic to beat him. So, we use the terrain to our advantage and start wailing on him with our spark spell. Additionally, we use the new storm call shout that we just learned to help damage him faster. It gets a little bit scary though, as we try luring close enough to hit him, we get stuck on the terrain and can't get out of range of his attack. In an incredible stroke of luck, he didn't use a power attack, meaning that we lived through the attack and were able to relocate to some other terrain. From here, we just need to wait it out, and our storm call lands the final blow, proving our worth to enter the Hall of Valor. After crossing the bridge, we head inside and meet the ancient Nord heroes that taught us the Dragon Ring Shout. These heroes agree to help us finally kill Alduin once and for all. So, we head back across the bridge, clear the thick fog, and begin the battle of our lives. Immediately, we use the scroll of Call to Arms, making the Nord heroes stronger for the whole fight. Alduin, in return, uses his Meteor Storm Shout, which we already know the dangers of. This fight is very similar to the previous Elden fight, where we just sit back and pelt him with arrows, taking short breaks to Dragon Ridden and heal up. As Alduin gets close to death, I decide that I'm not done with him. This challenge has been lurking in my mind for seven months. Seven months of Alduin taunting me. Seven months of Todd Howard taunting me. Seven months of pain. Seven months of turmoil, a broken motherboard, a broken graphics card, seven months of struggle leading to seven deaths, all leading up to one last hit. Finally, finally, this challenge is over. Finally, I can sleep at night knowing that I won't need to wake up a loser nerd geek that can't beat the challenge. Finally, I'd like to thank all of you that made it here to the end. You guys have shown me insane support with my Beyond Legendary video. I'm so appreciative of all the nice comments you guys have been leaving me. I'd love to be able to keep making videos like this one in the future, and I've got a couple planned already. Now that the challenge is over, there's only one thing left for me to do. Thanks for watching.